Before we can start our actual demonstration flight and fly in the airplane, we need to understand what we're trying to accomplish and how we're going to go about it, at least the basics. Uh, I know that many of you understand and are familiar with the modern VOR radio navigation system, but you're probably completely unaware of how the four-course radio range system worked before VORs were invented. So I'll be just, I'll be reading to you um, a couple of paragraphs in the Wikipedia entry. If you Google low frequency radio range, you will come up with a wealth of information about the, how the radio range is used to work. Um, but the mill is Bobcat has a full and authentic simulation of the radio range system and contains a virtual set of radio ranges for the entire United States and Canada as they would have appeared in about 1944. So, what are these ranges? Well, let me read this to you. The Low Frequency Radio Range, LFR, also known as the Four Course Radio Range, the LFMF Four Course Radio Range, the AN Radio Range, ADCOC Radio Range, or commonly just the range, was the main navigation system used by aircraft for instrument flying in the 1930s and 1940s until the advent of the VHF Omnidirectional Range, the VOR, which was beginning in the 1940s. It was used for en route navigation as well as instrument approaches and holds. Based on a network of radio towers which transmitted directional radio signals, the LFR defined specific airways in the sky. Pilots navigated the LFR by listening to a stream of automated A and N Morse codes. For example, they would turn the aircraft to the right when hearing an N stream, to the left when hearing an A stream, and fly straight ahead when hearing a steady tone. Alright, that's a basic description. Uh, there's much more in the uh, Wikipedia article, but that's all we need to know just to find out what these darn things are. Let's take a look at the one we're going to be using in our demonstration. This is an approach chart for the radio range at the Charlotte Airport as it would have been located and aligned in about 1944 or 1945. Our goal will be to fly from a small municipal airport about 10 miles away along the beam to the airport and then align ourselves on another beam coming out. Well, what am I talking about when I'm talking about these beams? A VOR transmits 360 radials around it, but a four-course beam transmits, you guessed it, only four beams. These beams could be aligned on just about any headings that the, uh, that the designers of the particular station wanted to set them at, and they could be changed. We're looking at the Charlotte, North Carolina range. And what we're looking at here is a set of four beams, one of which is radiating from the station, which is in the center here, out along the 003 magnetic heading. Another beam heads easterly along 093. Another beam goes southerly at 183. And the western beam, the one we're going to be mostly using, goes out to the west at a heading of 273 degrees. Now, how do these beams work? What, what the heck is going on here? Well, let me tell you that this uh, radio range consisted of two powerful low-frequency transmitters and an antenna network that aligned it in such a way that the A transmitter transmits a Morse code A in this quadrant for the Charlotte range and this quadrant. And the N transmitter transmits a Morse code N to this quadrant up here and this one down here. Well, so what? Um, that doesn't really help us very much. If we have an airplane flying somewhere, like maybe where this orange circle is, where we're going to start our demonstration flight, we'll hear an A. Well, big deal. That doesn't tell us much. We could be up here and hear an A, or over here and hear an A. Anywhere. doesn't matter. If we were down here, we'd hear an N. The key is the border between the A and the N broadcast. That forms the beam. Along the beam, the A and the N signals blend together. It so happens that an A is dit da and an N is da dit. Those two letters, when blended together in a very precise way, form a continuous tone. So that 
If you're along this beam right along the border between the A and the N, you will hear a continuous tone. If you're on this side, you'll hear an A, and if you're on this side, you'll hear an N. This allows us to fly along the beam. It doesn't tell us very much about what direction we're heading. If we headed west, we would hear the same continuous tone as we were heading east. But because this is an AM transmitter, low frequency transmitter, we can actually tell which direction we're going by whether the signal is gradually getting stronger and louder or weaker. If we're heading toward the station, it's going to be getting stronger. If we're heading away, it's going to be getting weaker. Now, it's important to realize that the A and the N, this is not a digital system, it is an analog system, and the A and the N do not blend together perfectly into a continuous tone except in the center of this beam. On the sides, the blend is such that the N and the A and the tone struggle with one another and produce a kind of a warbling, distorted N or distorted A. These distorted areas were called twilight zone in the parlance of the time, and those twilight zones are very important because in reality you did not want to fly along the continuous tone of the beam because as you were flying along the continuous tone toward Charlotte some other guy may be flying out to the west in the opposite direction along the continuous tone and you and he might meet somewhere along. So more or less like it does in uh, uh, highways inbound you would fly along the right hand side or the right hand twilight zone. The in twilight zone in this particular case. And if you were outbound, you would fly along the A twilight zone. This would keep reduce the chances of uh, collisions. We will be listening to the differences in what these different zones sound like. It can be somewhat difficult to tell until you get practice. Flying the radio ranges is a challenge to your piloting skills. This is absolutely not as simple as VOR navigation whatsoever. But we're going to do it, and we're going to show you how it's going to work. So let's describe our demonstration flight. Now that we know how the, the range basically works, let's describe our demonstration flight. We're going to start at this orange circle, which is, a, which is the Gastonia Municipal Airport. It's 10 miles away from the Charlotte Range and very close to the westerly beam. So we're going to be taking off from runway 21 and pretty much turn immediately to a heading of 180 and track south. As we do, we'll be listening to our radio, our uh, AM receiver, which we will tune to 212 kilocycles. As we're listening, we will be hearing two things. We'll be hearing a continuous stream of A's being broadcast. In other words, we'll hear dot dash, dot dash, dot dash, dot dash. But every 30 seconds or so, that'll be interrupted by the broadcast of the station identification, and we will hear the Morse code for CLT which is this Morse code here. This is to help us know that we're tuned to the correct station. Um, the same system is used in VOR, but it's absolutely critical to pay attention to the uh, identification of these four course ranges because the ranges often overlapped and the uh, frequencies were set such that it was quite easy to tune the wrong range and fly the wrong way. So listening to the Morse code of the ID is very important. As we fly along this um, southerly course, we will hear an A, and then we will gradually, actually quite pretty abruptly, we'll hear that A start to change its tone as it begins to blend with the N on the other side. That means we'll be in the A twilight zone. Since we're flying straight across pretty quickly, within, um, say, a half minute or so, the distinct A will gradually fade out and become a continuous tone as we hear the N and the A blended perfectly together. And then as we keep flying, the N will gradually emerge from that tone. And when we get to the other side, we will hear a, a clear N. When we hear the clear N, we know we have crossed the beam. We will then turn around, make a left turn, and continue to fly on a 30 degree intercept heading until we hear that clear end start to get distorted. When we hear that distortion start, we know we're in the twilight zone, and that is the proper way to fly to the Charlotte Station. We will then turn to a heading of 0 93 degrees, and we will continue to own that heading and make any corrections that are necessary to keep us on course. How do we know what corrections? Well, if that distorted end starts to become a clear end, we know we're drifting a little bit too far to the south, and we will correct 
back to the left or the north. If, on the other hand, we that um, that garbled in becomes a continuous tone, we know that we're drifting a little bit to the left and we're, we're getting on the actual beam. We don't want that. We will correct a little bit to the south or to the right and get back in the twilight zone. The closer we get to the station, the narrower the beam becomes until as we get close to the station, it's going to be quite hard to stay on that beam. Um, you simply can sense that as you get close. We're going to be flying on a clear day, so we'll be actually see where we are, but in instrument conditions, it can be quite difficult as you approach this station. As you get over the station, the continuous A and the ID will fade out pretty quickly, and you will be in what's called the cone of silence. There is no transmission directly above the station. That's the way you know you've actually hit the station. As you fly over it, the silence will gradually, actually pretty abruptly be uh, thrown away by a signal on the other side of the station. As we cross, we'll probably pick up either a clear A or a distorted A from the twilight zone or the clear. But it doesn't really matter. What our intention is, is to fly back past the station for about a minute. Then we will make a left-hand turn, get into the clear in territory. We should be able to hear the signal change from an A to a distorted A to a continuous tone, then to a distorted in, and then finally to a clear in. We'll fly uh, an intercept padding of approximately 330 degrees until we hear that clear in start to distort. When we hear that, we know we are picking up the beam headed north out of here. We will then turn to a heading of 003 degrees and fly along that twilight. Now, we're not going to keep on flying. We'll stop after we know that we've intercepted that beam, but you can imagine how this system worked. There would be another beam uh, north of Charlotte in some city up there, and another radio range station with other beams that would possibly intersect with the Charlotte beam. You would get to the intersection and then pick up the other station, fly to it, and then over it, and then pick up another beam, go outbound until you picked up an inbound, and Continue to do that until you got to your destination. Once you do get to your destination, there is an instrument approach procedure, just like there is for the Charlotte Airport, where if you follow this procedure, which is very much like um, a modern uh, let, uh, approach procedure, although in the old days it was called a letdown, if you follow this procedure, you will find yourself able to land at the Charlotte Airport from the range. Um, that sounds simple. It's actually quite uh, difficult to do in practice. We're going to give it a shot here. Just a minute. We're going to jump into our airplane, and you will be sitting along with me as we do this demonstration flight, and we hope to do it successfully. So see you in the middle of this Bobcat, and we'll start tuning our radios. <laughs> 